Good morning, Gap Church. Uh, one more Sunday that we are here together, even though apart, but we can celebrate together. Uh, Jesus, the one who came to save us. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, um, and I was just reading this passage in Matthew 21. That that's when Jesus comes to Jer uh, Jerusalem as king. Uh, and in verse 8 says, uh, verse 9 actually says, The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our hope and our light in times of darkness. And that's why we celebrate him. That's why we can come together uh, even though you are in your house. And again, I just want to encourage you, even though you are in, a, in your house, maybe in your living room, or in your bedroom, but I really encourage you to take time and really worship the Lord. Don't be a, a, someone who is just watching it. Don't be a customer, but be part of what God is doing in the Gap Church. Even though we are not together, but that's a time to celebrate life. Celebrate because we can be together thanks to technology that is also God's provision for us. So let's uh, sing Hosanna. The 
Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Palm Sunday service as we start the celebration of the Holy Week. Sadly, we won't have a Tenebrae service this year due to the lockdown, but our Easter services uh, will continue. The Easter Friday service on the 10th and the Sunday Easter Sunday service on Sunday the 12th uh, will both be broadcast via the YouTube channel, the Gap YouTube channel. Uh, and those services will commence at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, I'd just like to thank Rory for the daily devotionals that he's been putting up on YouTube. For those who haven't yet listened to them, I really encourage you to do that. Um, Rory puts a little four to five minute clip on daily uh, on YouTube. Uh, and the link is shared via the different WhatsApp groups. And all you have to do is just click on that link and it'll take you directly to the devotional. They really are wonderful messages of encouragement um, as we go through this time of isolation. Uh, a couple of our folk are having birthdays this week. I'd like to congratulate um, Carla Claster for her birthday on Monday the 6th, uh, Millwood Mpalanjala on Tuesday the 7th, uh, Sue Gordon on Wednesday the 8th, and Beauty Kawanga on Saturday the 11th. Uh, just really wish all of you a really happy and blessed birthday in these isolated times. Would you just bow your heads with me as we go into time of intercessory prayer. Father God, I lift up all those members of our congregation who are experiencing illness, broken and difficult relationships, financial uncertainty, Lord, especially during this lockdown where there's a great fear, Father, of people losing their jobs. We lift up the lonely, Father, and just pray that you'd be their comfort. I pray in particular for Merle Hunter, Berlin Peterson, Brown Mayer. Father God, we thank you that the coronavirus test came back negative for Brian, but we pray that you'd be with him as he lies in hospital in, in isolation uh, and not having... Uh, any visitors, it must be really difficult for him, Lord. Just be close to him and comfort him. We lift up Olga van Niekirk during this period of sadness, having just lost her son Charles. We pray for Celine Drake, my niece Daniel Pao Chong, Tracy van Heerden, Anas Bosov. Father, we pray that they'll feel your presence and be comforted during their time of need. Lord Jesus, you're the master of life and death. Just one touch from you restores the sick, heals the broken and transforms the darkness. We pray for your grace and mercy on these your children, Father. Lord Jesus, this COVID-19 virus has placed the world in an unprecedented and uncertain time. But we're comforted by the knowledge that you, Father, are in control and we don't have to fear for anything. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones and have become ill from this pandemic. We ask that you grant them the true peace and comfort that you alone can give. We lift up our President and his team, Lord, during this time as they make various decisions for the country and we pray, Father, that all those decisions are the right ones. We pray too for the doctors and the medical teams who are on the front line of treating those who have contracted the virus and ask that you bless and keep them safe. We pray against panic and fear, Lord, and ask that you bless our country and place your hand of protection over all of our citizens. We ask all these things in your most precious and holy name. Amen. We just uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would be with you, uh, that your hearts would be open right now, that your minds would be open, that you would receive the message that God has placed on Rory's heart. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Wasn't worshipping with the Lord delightful last week? Mom and I really enjoyed singing along with Raphael and listening to Rory's message. We hope you did so too, and we're encouraged by it. 
This morning we also want to give you another opportunity to bring your tithes and your offerings to the Lord this morning. And you can do so through the SnapScan app or you can do so through EFT. Through SnapScan you can see the code at the bottom of the screen and you can just scan that. Paul shares with us a very important spiritual principle in the book of Philippians, verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. And he says, when you give to the work of the Lord, you're actually adding to your spiritual account, i.e. you're actually building up treasures in heaven. So when we give this morning to the work of the Lord, that's for sharing the gospel, for meeting the needs of the poor, or even providing for God's ministers in the church, you're actually adding to your spiritual account. You're building up treasures in heaven. So as we consider prayerfully about giving this morning, as receivers of the gospel, let's consider how we can give to the Lord's work this morning. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are the giver of all good things. And Lord, as recipients this morning, we want to be generous too, as you have been generous to us. Cause us to be imitators of God this morning in our giving. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Bless you. We're going to continue to worship the Lord now with a few songs. Um, we're going to talk about the name of the Lord, how his name, because of his name, mountains shake and crumble. Every situation can change. As we come together um, as the body of Christ and many other churches are doing the same all over the world. Uh, let's trust and hope in the name of Jesus who can change anything and uh, even this virus and all this crisis that we are facing now, um, at his name, things can change. So let's get together as the, the body of Christ, as the church of God, and let's sing this song at your name. At your name, the mountain shade can crumble. At your name, the oceans roll and tumble. At your name. Earth we rejoice, the people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. We up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. The morning breaks in glory. At your name, creation sings your story. At your name, angels will you die. Earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. God, we will sing, we will sing, there is 
Shout her name, shout her name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Ooh, 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 ooh. 
Sha 
you because we can say it is well with our souls even in the midst of darkness even in the midst of uncertainties and doubts we can say it is well because our hope is in you not in men not in in doctors not in anybody lord but in you and in you we trust in you we hope lord please have mercy on us please be with us as we we listen to your word in your name we pray. Amen. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this broadcast service on Palm Sunday. We're obviously in such a difficult and uncertain time in our country and in our world with the spread of the coronavirus and the devastation that it has caused. Church leaders are doing all they can to retain something of the practice of fellowship, community and worship and some sort of church exposure at a time when public gatherings are prohibited. And so the question we ask as we deal with the issues and the events of Palm Sunday is to ask what has the what is the relevance of Palm Sunday and in fact the whole of Holy Week culminating on Easter Sunday? What has that got to say to us at this time? And to answer that, we've got to go back to that first day of the week, Sunday. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem took place on that Sunday. It was the last week of his life. And what takes place is the beginning of a drama designed by God, a real-life drama demonstrating God's nature and purposes in, in a very powerful and unforgettable way. It has been said that no week in human history has affected mankind as much as this single week, beginning with Palm Sunday and culminating on Easter Sunday. So let me paint the picture for your imagination. Jesus has been ministering dramatically in the towns and countryside of Israel for the past three years. And he now enters the capital, Jerusalem, during the Jewish Passover, when hundreds of thousands of Jews from across the world have gathered for the annual Passover celebrations. Israel's long-awaited Messiah is coming to them. And all four Gospels record his entry into Jerusalem. And I would like to read from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey, and there with her colt tied beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. He, if anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took, took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The peak crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So the facts are that Jesus comes to a small village, Bethpage, a few kilometers outside of Jerusalem. It is situated on the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sends two disciples into the village and tells them they will find a donkey in its cult, and he was to bring them to him. He tells them to answer anyone who asks their reason for taking the animals with these words, the Lord needs them. 
The di disciples do as instructed and bring the animals to Jesus. They place cloaks on the colt and he rides into the city. The gospel writers record that this act fulfilled a prophecy in Zechariah 9. Say to the daughter of Zion, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey on the colt, the foal of a donkey. So what Matthew is saying is that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem that day is the presentation finally of Israel's long-awaited Messiah. This was Israel's time, time for decision. And things start out well. The very large crowd gathers and spread their cloaks on the ground, while others cut branches from palm trees and spread them on the ground. The crowds run ahead of him, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now that chant they're singing comes from one of their well-known songs. It was sung by them often when they had a celebration day and when they would process to the sacrificial altar in the temple. The whole song is recorded in Psalm 118. Let me read from verses 19 through to 27. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Now don't miss the irony. It's a song of celebration and adoration of God. Their are branches being waved and people are shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Exactly what they were doing on Palm Sunday. But right in the middle of that psalm is a verse which is in stark contrast to the celebrations. It goes like this, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now who do you think the builders are? Who are the ones who are going to reject the Messiah? It's the very people who are singing the song. It's the same crowd who sing in the song on Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the message is not limited to Israel's rejection of the Messiah. It's a foretelling of the world's rejection of Christ, the stone who the builders will reject. Now I want you to notice again where this procession ends up. In verse 27 we read, Join us in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. It ends at the horns of the altar, the altar of sacrifice. The altar had a horn on each corner against which a sacrificial animal would be tied before being slaughtered. The blood of the sacrifice would be sprinkled all over the altar. So this psalm sung often by the Jews during their Passover celebrations is a prophecy of Holy Week. The triumphal entry on Sunday and the cross, the Lamb of God on the altar of sacrifice by the Friday. So I pause to wonder what was on Jesus' mind as he heard them singing the opening lines of Psalm 118 and thinking to himself, I know how this is going to end. And it doesn't take long for the opposition to start. Jesus had already told his disciples what would happen. But let's look at the progression. The conflict is recorded in Luke 19.39, which records that the Jewish leaders tell Jesus to rebuke his followers so they can be quiet, because they're obviously creating quite a disturbance. Jesus answered, if they keep quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. And then in Luke 91, 41 to 44, we get this dramatic incident. As Jesus approaches Jerusalem and sees the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground. 
Jesus is saying, in effect, if you'd only known that this was your time, your time for repentance, forgiveness, new life and change, you would have peace. It is being offered to you right now. But it is hidden from your eyes. And because you've not recognized the time of God's coming to you, it won't be too long before enemies surround and destroy your city and raise it to the ground. Within one generation of 40 years, Jerusalem is lying completely devastated with its people taken prisoner and scattered across the Roman Empire. The siege of Jerusalem was begun in AD 67 and the Romans finally sacked the city and broke through in AD 70. So Jesus here weeps over the city beforehand and he predicts its downfall. Here he's presented to the nation on Palm Sunday and the response of the Jewish leaders is predictable. They begin to plot to arrest him and put him to death. And from there, Jesus begins to openly confront the Jewish authorities. In Luke 19.45, he clears the temple and the leaders of the people begin to focus their plans to kill him. Jesus gives various parables which foretell the rejection of him. He gives a parable of the wedding banquet where the invited guests reject the invitation and the king invites others from the highways and the byways in Matthew 22. He gives a parable about workers in the vineyard killing the son of the owner when he came to them in Luke 20, verse 9. After he gives that parable, in Luke 20, 17, it records that Jesus looked directly at them and asks, What is the meaning of the statement in Psalm 118, 22, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The leaders knew he was speaking about them and looked for ways to arrest him, but they were afraid of the people at that stage. And then in Matthew 23, we get the record of a stinging attack by Jesus on the Jewish leaders, where he calls them hypocrites and blind guides. He refers to them as whitewashed tombs, painted on the outside, but inside full of dead men's bones. And then he concludes with these immortal words in verse 37 of Matthew 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Now, I would like to share a personal testimony of mine. When I was a young man at school at St. George's College in Zimbabwe, at the oldest school in that country, before I'd become a Christian, I was involved in what was called a passion play with hundreds of other uh, students from both our school and the local convent, girls' convent. And we were part of a crowd. Um, and the passion play was set against these stone buildings of St. George's College with its towers. And um, our, our task was to be the crowd that welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem and then were the same crowd that were later were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. I remember being part of that crowd, and we had to practice it for several days, hearing these words from Jesus uh, said to us several times, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have longed to have gathered you as a hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. We will listen to the very heartbeat of a God who is offering himself to his people with a longing for them to come to him. It was not some unemotional, detached God with no interest in humanity. And he, we know he loves us far more than we can ever imagine. And when I heard those words, it began to stir a desire, just the glimmerings of my first desires to come to know this God who loved me so much and it left me ashamed at how we had treated him. So here on Palm Sunday and the days that followed, Jesus is presented to the nation of Israel, the historically chosen people of God, and he invites them, and in fact all of us, into relationship with him. Now I want you to take, I want to take you to another scene five days later. It was the Friday, it was a dark day, in fact by midday one writer says it was black as night. On a hillside out of Jerusalem, silhouetted against the sky is a cross. And there hanging from the cross is a body that has been so battered and beaten that it is hardly recognisable. The lifeblood of this individual is slowly dripping from his wounds in his head, his hands and his chest. Every now and then he groans and utters something, but it's hardly audible. Someone watching could be heard to ask, who is this man? What has he done that can have been so wrong? 
And then the person might take a second look and say, isn't that the man that entered Jerusalem a few days ago on the Sunday? Isn't that Jesus of Nazareth? What's happened to all the crowds? What about the people he said to have healed? Where is everybody? Where, where are his disciples? The author Calvin Miller writes in the second book of his trilogy called The Singer these words. Humanity is fickle. They may dress for a morning coronation and never feel the need to change clothes to attend an execution in the afternoon. So triumphal Sundays and Good Fridays always fit comfortably into the same Easter week. There on the cross is the one and only Son of God, without sin and dying alone, himself carrying humanity's sin. Scripture tells us, for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son. So what do we choose? We, so unworthy, so caught up in our pride and selfishness in our little worlds, are being offered forgiveness and life and a hope in heaven. And one would think, surely the choice is obvious to all. God has shown his love to us. And yet, and yet he will not force us to love him in return. The picture is always of God inviting us into a voluntary relationship with him, in much the same way a groom would invite the girl who would eventually become his bride. The choice is always yours. God can only warn you of the dangers of refusal and the consequences, but he will not force your love. So what's it to be? It's been said, how can anyone refuse such an offer, such a great salvation, such an offer of forgiveness, the promise of eternal life? Surely that's what we all want. But here is the tragedy and the story typical of mankind. The precious cornerstone was rejected by the builders. The stone that's been cut for us and has been rejected, God has made into this incredible precious cornerstone, the salvation of the world. What's your choice? Will you choose to love and follow the one who paid that sacrifice for you? He gives you this invitation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens, I will come in and eat with him. Come, let's pray. God, we thank you during this Easter period that you offer us salvation through the cross. And I pray for all listening today that we would again be challenged by your incredible love shown to us through your son Jesus as he's offered to the Jewish nation and to humanity. This is my son. Believe in him and you'll have eternal life. And I pray for those of us who perhaps have been at a distance from God for whatever reason, that even today our hearts would begin to soften, that we would again see the love that God has shown us in giving us his one and only Son, whom he loved so much, to die in our place. Stir our hearts again, give us faith to believe and receive, and say yes to you, Jesus, that we too can have forgiveness and eternal life in you. Pray this for each of us, and I pray it in Jesus' most precious and glorious name. Amen. We're going to conclude the service with a closing song. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I love you. I 
love the voice You have led me through the fire In the darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I the goodness of God. Your goodness is running out, it's running out of me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out of me. With my life laid out, I'm surrendered now. I can do For this time where we can sing about your goodness and we can just remember that you are king who came to save us and we still hold to that uh, to that truth that you are the one who saved us and our hope is all on you lord in your name we pray amen may the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen